people will recognize me already, but just in case there's somebody out there on videotape that doesn't recognize the name of Marshall Fritz, which is probably everybody that's watching it, <laughs> that's who I am, and I welcome you again to this uh, presentation at the Separation of School and State Alliance first annual conference, the launching of the Separation of School and State movement here in beautiful downtown Arlington, Virginia, on a magnificent November the 11th, a Saturday afternoon, 1995. Our next speaker, again, is so well known to so many people here, the heroic John Taylor Gatto, that um, I believe that the reading of the introduction is necessary only for those people out there uh, by the uh, millions who will be listening to this tape who maybe have yet to experience John, so they need to know a little bit about him. John Taylor Gatto taught public school children in Manhattan for 26 years. 30 and years. 30 years. Okay. 30 years, Marshall. <laughs> and he taught them well. Now, you want to be correct me again? <laughs> now, wait a minute. He's not supposed to tease the introducer. I'm not supposed to tease the speaker. All right, we've we, 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 we got to call a truce and start over. He was a New York City Teacher of the Year three years, and then the New York State Teacher of the Year in 1991. When he responded, uh, to the, uh, or gave, they gave him the award, he got to speak to the, uh, I believe it was the Assembly or the Senate of the New York uh, House, and he stood there and he told them that uh, this stunning pronouncement, that public schools are injurious to children. He abruptly resigned from teaching and has since gained international acclaim, just back from Singapore, of his brilliant historical dissection of the public school mechanism and how it manipulates our children's intellects and mangles their spirits. Powerful speaker, essayist, and thinker, Mr. Gatto has authored Dumbing Us Down, uh, The Exhausted School, and is currently at work on his forthcoming book, The Empty Child. But I want to go and say something else about John. There's a, there's a, a warmth, a, um, uh, uh, a, a kindness. Now, here I am, an upstart with a new school called Pioneer Christian Academy in Fresno, and I saw his piece in the Wall Street Journal, and somehow I uh, was able to track him down and and called him up, and he doesn't even like the telephone, but we talked for 45 minutes the first time we met. And uh, later I got a nice uh, supportive letter from him, and it just went on and on and on to become a relationship uh, that I, uh, I treasure. But he's, one, he's more than that. Uh, I believe he's a rare person in that he seems to have, from all I can tell, I haven't experienced him in the classroom, but from all I can tell, uh, he, I have high confidence that he is one of those truly gifted teachers or or person who has taken his talents and, 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 and honed them so that he can work with children and inspire them to raise to uh, what they are capable of. So he's got that kind of magic that some teachers seem to have. But he also has the ability to think uh, profoundly and deeply uh, to uh, abstract up a, a couple, three notches on the uh, intellectual food chain and look at the big picture. And uh, for that, we owe him uh, in immense uh, um, respect because because of that 30 years of teaching in the trenches he gains respect from his fam fellow teachers but because he is able to go beyond just looking at the ruts and seeing all of the furrows uh, he actually then can give us some insights that are worth listening to his uh, enigmatic title for this presentation is the logical tragedy of Benson Vermont will you please excuse me would you please <laughs> try to do your best to welcome <laughs> John Taylor Gatto. Uh, Marshall's wrong about two things. He's wrong about vouchers and he's wrong about me being a dynamic speaker. Uh, but, but he certainly opened my eyes to some dangers that are inherent in vouchers. We won't talk about that right now. I'd like to recognize a few people in this room uh, who I've seen in my travel around the country. When I quit in 1991, uh, I got a call from NASA Goddard Space Center to come down. And then I got a call from the uh, Financial Control Board of United Technologies, who I guess had r read the Wall Street Journal piece. And I thought I'd speak three or four times. I, uh, I don't enjoy speaking before audiences that are older than 13 years because they can't speak back. And you can, obviously. Uh, 
But I've now, in the last four years, been in 471 locations. And I try not to say the same thing twice because Jerry Mintz is always there uh, speaking. <laughs> anyway, I think there's some, probably all of you are rare and unusual people, but some of the ones I've encountered in traveling around the country are our man in Havana in the uh, Department of Education. I don't know if I should, if I should put a name uh, on that, but I will. His name's Jack Clank, and he has a distinction if many of you know Jack, you may not know this about him. In the history of American theology, there has only been one religious group that actually found the secret, and they all died out except Jack. Uh, they're the Plymouth Brethren, and someday Jack's going to write the biography of the group. Uh, I was privileged to run into Pat Montgomery several times, who who I can, it's a pretty lady here in red. Uh, she's the Clone Lara School up in Ann Arbor, and she's also all over the world with, what, about 2,000, 6,000 students are, uh, are around the world, but about 50 up there in Ann Arbor, right, in little white sheds where you can practice your <laughs> uh, pedagogy. Uh, <laughs> Then this is fascinating, and I may have Jack Clank to thank for this. Uh, I'm privy to uh, most of the global conspiracy theories that have been around for throughout this century, and I'm also privy to the intellectual source of them. Uh, Dr. Carol Quigley of Georgetown, in a magnificent book, Tragedy and Hope, a History of the World in Our Time, which you'll find has been removed from every public library in the United States, but you can obtain, it's being bootlegged out of California, somewhere around Santa Clara. Anyway, in this magnificent volume, Quigley, uh, who, who was a senior professor and uh, Bill, Bill Clinton's private mentor at Georgetown, uh, Quigley mentions the key names who, who kept this shadow thing that he's uh, presenting in the book alive through the century and the key colleges, uh, the key programs. Uh, about three years ago, I got a call from a woman in Washington named Dorothy Goodman, and she said, I'm going to be in New York City. Uh, could we have a cup of tea together? And we met around the public library and had a cup of tea. In the course of a one-hour conversation, Dorothy dropped every single inside name that had created the 20th century universe as a private friend. Now, I thought I had heard it all until uh, uh, last year, I believe, in San Francisco at a meeting of the American Historical Association, which Dorothy invited me to. We were sitting having a beer afterwards, and I said, Dorothy, I've just discovered that all the administrative jobs in the United States have been under the control of a group called the Cleveland Conference since 1917. The source of that information is, uh, is uh, David Tyack, Managers of Virtue. Tyack's certainly not a conspiracy theorist there. And Dorothy said, the Cleveland Conference, why, they just invited me to, be a, to join, to be a member. <laughs> anyway. The, the, the lady who, who has edited for years the, the finest independent journal, I think, in the United States, Jackie Orsi, just announced to me when I told her I was going to plug it up here that she had dropped it because it's too much work. It, it was a publication that you could not get through without becoming furious. I mean, incensed with rage, tearing at it, <laughs> cracking your teeth there. Jackie says, because of that, no one, no one read it. <laughs> and, and, and Jerry Mintz, who I've encountered at least 38 times around the United States, especially when I'm speaking about the advisability of using ammonium nitrate to solve problems. There, Jerry's here, and Jerry, Jerry's just uh, uh, published, I think, the first comprehensive directory of alternatives. Do you have some copies here, Jerry? 
there, there he is. And he said that anyone who orders it here gets a 10% discount and he'll autograph them, didn't he? He said that. <laughs> okay. Uh, Kathy Duffy sent me a manuscript to read. Uh, Kathy, are you in the room? Yes. Sent me a manuscript to read, I guess a little more than a year ago. And the, if there's anything you hate to get, it's a manuscript in the mail. <laughs> there's nothing worse. A young girl from Eugene, Oregon, about three years ago, sent me an enormous manuscript, 700 pages, that turned out to be the Teenage Liberation Handbook. I, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with that. And I almost threw it away, except my mother raised me to be polite. And I set it aside in the bathroom, and one day in the tub, I picked it up, and it was it's one of the great classics of the century. Well, Kathy sent me her manuscript, which was smaller. And, and, and I read a few pages in a desultory way. I hope I pronounced that word right. It's back at the table there. And I said, what a lot of common sense this lady has. She, says she doesn't use all the wild abstractions and weave them together. She gets right to the point, just like my mother said people listen to. So I read it from start to finish. And I'd certainly recommend it. And it's a, it was a privilege to read it, Kathy. So there, she, she's that humble lady back there that was shut off in the last debate. <laughs> she said something unacceptable. <laughs> okay, I don't think I'm gonna recognize anyone else except Ed Nagel of the NCACS, which has been a bulwark of strength for most of the century, for a long time there. Uh, now, I have a, a pointless story to tell you, and it's not even funny, but I feel compelled to, to loosen up, and then I'll get into the talk. Uh, this morning at about 4 a.m., which is always when I write the talks, even though I announce the titles in advance, uh, I was reading Proverbs to get, uh, to, to organize the language in my head. I find that the, the King James Version is really great if you want some crackling phrase and you don't have to give credit for it because it's <laughs> the copyright's expired. <laughs> but anyway, up in 468, which is Marshall's floor, their plane, uh, as the nose in your face, was a big cockroach right in my room there. And I was really revolted, <laughs> the hour, the size of the roach. Uh, uh, so I grabbed Proverbs and I headed for the roach. But, but I couldn't bring myself to strike the, the roach dead with the word of God. <laughs> there was no appropriate biblical text that seemed to apply, so I suffered the roach to live. And, and, and I want to assign Pat Montgomery as her homework to figure out how I could possibly have made that dovetail with this talk. This is called The Logical Tragedy of Benson, Vermont. Not Benton, Vermont, this is in your handbook, but Benson, Vermont. Uh, the town of Benson, Vermont voted down its current school budget nine times. It's a little town in the western part of the state, about 20 miles from, from the New York State border, establishing a state record for negativity according to Education Week newspaper of July of this year. The assistant superintendent of Benson Charlie Usher, a thoughtful man as he's described in the article, uh, was bewildered at his town's irresponsibility. Mr. Usher suggested that, quote, we should try to get at the root of why people would be willing to let their schools fall apart and think somebody else will catch them. In a similar vein, Teresa Mulholland who was the principal at the Benson School. And in the article, she was portrayed as a tough talking lady. Uh, it regarded the town as you and I might regard ornery children. She said, nobody here has an agenda. I think they just wanna say no. Benson, it seems, is the bad boy of the state of Vermont. I understand there's a Vermont fella here who spoke at the microphone, so I've gotta watch what I say. This piece of journalism in Education Week covered a 
two-page tabloid spread. And if you don't know Education Week, it's, it's the Bible of the school business. Yet nowhere in the piece was there any indication that the problem might be that the citizens of Benson do not regard the Benson School as their school at all. Uh, to use Charlie Usher's language, their school at all, nor is there a hint that Benson might have abandoned long ago believing that what happens in Vermont schools is all that educational or an enterprise worth a substantial part of their incomes to support. I read this amazing newspaper account three times before its fact content floated up out of the pro-administrator's slant. Let me feed you the facts as Education Week sort of distributed them through this, this vast piece, except instead of scattering them through two large pages of small print, I'm going to group them in a way that a sensible person will find relevant. And, and I want you to consider this a clinic in how to read between the lines. The heart of the matter, mentioned without any emphasis by Education Week, is that there are exactly 137 children in Benson School District, which is contained in its one brand new school building. The entire school district is coterminous with that school. The new school building itself is a sidebar issue, but it's worth a, a look before we turn to the main story. The new school caused property taxes to go up 40% last year. It seems, as usual, there was a, an underestimate, quite a shock to those hanging on to their homes by their fingernails in Benson. Many in town had claimed that a new building was not needed, but the state condemned the old structure, demanding it either be brought into compliance with the code at a cost the state estimated was very near the estimated price of a brand new school, or deliver a yes vote on the new building plans. Taxpayers were in effect given no choice but to bite the bullet. So as you might expect, the new school was voted, albeit narrowly, and when that happened, what happened then will be no surprise to those who understand building contractor estimates and final costs. The building turned out to cost about three times more than the voters were told that it would, though perhaps I might be forgiven a little skepticism for doubting whether it cost more than the state of Vermont expected it to, a much different matter going to the heart of popular despair with government. Oddly enough, though I'm from western Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh, I happen to have prior experience with the Vermont Education Department's condemnation of school structures. Give me a minute and you'll see that what I know from a previous experience with Vermont may have a bearing on Benson. Northeast of Benson, about three hours away, is the town of Walden, Vermont, where four one-room schoolhouses were condemned a few years ago, about three years ago. The people of Walden asked me to come up and speak at a rally where a citizen group calling itself the Road Rats was trying to mobilize support to vote down the new centralized school that would come about when these four little one-room schoolhouses were closed. The Road Rats had already won a, such a vote once before, temporarily beating back the project. But now Montpelier had condemned the traditional structures and all estimates, does this sound familiar, to bring them up to code were close enough to the price of a new school that it looked like the resistors would not have heart to fight any longer for the old ones. When I arrived in Walden, I toured the condemned places. They were handsome, honest little buildings, very attractive, sound as a dollar, solid, termite-free, filled with light and honest details from the last century, much, much more spacious than a typical classroom, much prettier, and every 
single kid in every one of the schools and their families loved being there. Just by chance, I happened to have drunk some beer a few years ago with a Vermont master architect when he was building an entire Cape Cod home in Provincetown, Massachusetts with only one local bad boy as an assistant, and he was doing it to show that house building could be done for much less than the building trade advertises. In the parking lot of the Captain Lysander in there, he put up a lovely, interesting house in six weeks, 42 days, one assistant for a cost of $45,000, including all the materials and his fee. So I called him from Walden, and the architect agreed to drive over, look at the Walden schools, and give an estimate what it would cost to bring them into compliance with the building code. And after doing that, which he did in about two hours, Vermont, Montpelier only has 13,000 people, the state capital, and everything's reasonably close. He pronounced the estimates cynical and fraudulent. He said they were four to five times higher than the work could be done by an independent contractor making a good profit. And he said cynical because he knew the people who had made the bids, and he said, this was being done in order to kill the one-room schoolhouses. It had nothing to do with, uh, with any building purpose or builder's purpose. So I asked him to submit a competitive bid, and he said, I can't. He said, I wouldn't get another job in the state of Vermont if I did. So, so much for moonshine in Vermont. Now, let me get back to Benson and its school budget. Here in a classic illustration of the state feeding as a parasite on its citizens, and not a state that we usually consider a parasitic state, Education Week saw a deep mystery. Let me put a different, more radically democratic spin on things. Here in a district jurisdiction of exactly 137 children, a number which could have been managed brilliantly by eight teachers without any supervision other than the town's willing citizens. And historically, they would have provided that, super, uh, that supervision. Taxpayers are being led to believe that a small, modestly endowed community must sustain the expense of here exactly is what the $900,000 school budget says they need. A superintendent for 137 kids, a non-teaching superintendent, a non-teaching assistant superintendent, a non-teaching principal, a non-teaching vice principal, a full-time nurse, a full-time guidance counselor, a full-time librarian, 11 full-time teachers, an unknown number of secretaries, part-time specialists, a nutritionist, custodial help, fax machines, copy machines, telephones, state-of-the-art computers, and much, much more. 137 children. This is indeed, to, to borrow an expression from Paulo Freire, radical pedagogy. The judgment of the people of Benson is mutely witnessed by their nine consecutive rejections of the school budget. Does this throw a different light on Assistant Superintendent Charlie Usher's bewilderment at their irresponsibility? What is happening in Benson? The use of schooling as a robber's cave from which predators dash out to loot the public is happening all over the United States. Eliminating the first seven positions on this list, the non-teaching superintendent, the non-teaching assistant superintendent, the non-teaching principal, the non-teaching vice principal, the full-time nurse, the full-time guidance counselor, and the full-time librarian would save $600,000, about 61% of the total budget. But far from overburdening 
the eight teachers and their small 17 student classes. It would give them a genuinely professional communitarian workplace, much more interesting and useful for educational purposes than the present overstaffed chain of command hothouse. 100 years ago in early 19th and early 20th century Benson, those same 137 children would have fit nicely into four one-room schoolhouses, just exactly like the ones the state tore down in Walden recently. There would have been a challenging, frequently productive experience for most of those kids, growing up under the direction of the town, their parents, and four school teachers, not 11, and the rest of the cancerous support staff. Only a calculating machine could consider a large consolidated school to which children must be bused long distances and advance in the life of children. And only someone who doesn't understand what the intellect is and how it grows would assume that you need machinery and procedures to do that or that the science of pedagogy has the slightest understanding how a mind is built, or a character. Strike that last remark as prejudicial. And consider this instead. Who in your judgment has the moral right to decide what size leisure class can be fastened on the backs of the working citizens of Benson, Vermont? Whose decision should that be? I see from a chart included in the Education Week article, that Vermont school bureaucrats extract $6,500 for each student who sits in their spanking new schools. That's $162 a week per child. How is it that the private schools of the United States provide a satisfactory level of service for a national average of only $3,000 a kid about $58 a week per child, or that parochial schools do it for $2,300, $44 a week per child, or that home schools do it for between $500 and $1,000, a mere 10 or 20 bucks a week. How is that? And don't answer, allow me, because I've got the microphone. <laughs> Those other named entities don't have to support a vast pyramid of political jobs. They value learning, but they don't make the mistake of overvaluing teaching or expertise. And they understand, perhaps instinctively, that transferring responsibility from children, parents, and communities to legions of certified agents of the state destroys the value base of human life. And the earlier discussion of what mechanism might possibly call, uh, cause the diminution of family size uh, with the increase of uh, government schooling, it seems to me having spent 30 years inside those places with wealthy white kids as well as poor black kids and all the degrees in between, it's because schools systematically remove the appetite for responsibility. They will not allow it to survive. And certainly anyone contemplating having a child uh, who has the slightest amount of uh, ability to cast his mind into the future knows that there's gonna be an awful lot of responsibility I mean, we have 45 million children being drilled in being irresponsible, unless you consider doing your homework a responsibility, because I don't. I think that's a phony responsibility. The infinitely articulated ladder of scientific school keeping, yes, I use the word sarcastically, but schools of pedagogy at the University of Chicago or at uh, uh, Johns Hopkins or Wisconsin or Stanford would not use scientific pedagogy sarcastically, of which you've just seen the lower rungs down in Benson, Vermont, 
lies squarely at the heart of dysfunctional American schooling today, and it surely lies at the heart of the dysfunctional American family. Scientific schooling does not dare allow the citizens of Benson to work out their educational destinies for themselves. They must pay and pay for the privilege of having the state legally commandeer their children and co-rear them as the state sees fit. And I will predict to you now that inside of 10 years, that what has happened in Oklahoma City and in with derailed trains and at the World Trade Center, you're going to see everywhere because we're choking to death in 50 states of the Union and it's no longer tolerable and it's no longer a matter to be debated. There, Jerry, that, that's a consistency. <laughs> it would be superficial not to point out that hiring all these functionaries in Benson propagates a social philosophy distinctly contrary to the dissenting philosophy of the 17th and 18th centuries, which gave us the United States in the first place. This contemporary social policy, utterly illegitimate in the popular mind, is aimed at a minimum to centrally provide jobs at the expense of education at the expense of family relations, at the expense of intellectual endeavor, and much more. All values in such a scheme have to be adjusted to the maintenance of a prescribed economic order by agreement, if available, by guile, if possible, and by force, if necessary. Benson, Vermont is a tragedy without a villain, a tragedy that grows logically out of the needs of an economy which stole all the work from millions and millions of independent livelihoods this nation used to encourage and sucked it up into gigantic government bureaus, gigantic international corporations, and gigantic institutions like hospitals and colleges. In such a never-never world, forced schooling must discourage children and families from regarding themselves as independent producers. We school to create employees, to create functionaries, time servers, and a docile cohort of permanently unemployed, and to produce a population accustomed to waiting for a teacher to tell them what to do. We cannot really afford school reform what prevents it isn't a pack of human vampires scheming to suck the blood of the innocent taxpayers of Benson, Vermont, but an inhuman, out of control, macro system economy which forces large numbers of people into work that doesn't need to be done. What a century of evidence has proven compellingly is this, that the collective imagination of big government big business and big institutions working together is radically inadequate to its primary task to design satisfying work full of meaning for everyone. This duty, once discharged fairly well by individuals, families, and local communities in the U.S., is more than a mere decoration or humane undertaking. It is the guardian of social stability and individual happiness, not food, shelter, and money, which can be provided by welfare schemes for poor and prosperous alike in a manner familiar to the Fabian milieu imposed on us in this country since the end of World War II. I used to watch classes of dangerous ghetto teenagers heal themselves in a hurry when I helped them find hard work to do work that needed to be done, which they knew needed to be done. That was the secret of all the 19 teaching awards I won when I was school teaching. I led children one by one to murderously hard work, turned them loose to tackle it, and demanded they be accountable. It can be no secret to any of you that forced government schooling is the only way to make a command economy work but the price exacted is too high. I, I should 
tell you my own prejudice since there are economists in the room. I don't believe we have a mixed economy. I think we have a pure command economy. But it's operated through private men's clubs. It, it doesn't appear in the public press or in, in, in academic journals. We need a 6% employment rate to hold this apparatus together. We need to trick too many people into a lifetime of stupid work that does not need doing. And because of the necessary slippage between central mandates and local needs, we mismatch people and work, failing to respond to genuine human urgencies. In our schools, we pry millions of children loose from the essential timeless meaning of being alive. We professionals lie constantly to conceal our ignorance. We view any reform or reformers like Jaime Escalante or Marva Collins and the like who have insight enough to connect real meaning with meaningless schoolwork in the minds of children as outlaws to be arrested and punished. When I was uh, with the Financial Control Board of United Technologies, that's the controller of each of their 32 operating divisions. I spent eight hours with them. I burst out laughing after about four, and I said, there's something odd here. I said, any one of you guys make more in a month than I made in my lifetime. What, what exactly is this about? They showed me films of Jaime Escalante uh, practicing at Garfield High, and uh, they said, this is, the, uh, this is the destiny we hope for Connecticut. And I said, do any of you realize that he was hounded out of his job, his life was made unbearable, that he's north in Sacramento, but he can't possibly last there either? Schools which work best are small personal places, free of elaborate machinery, free of elaborated personnel. They have been ordered to expand elastically in this century to accommodate a weird variety of useless and dangerous employees, people like myself. Irrelevant administrators, bogus specialists, teachers and quasi-teachers so poorly educated themselves that they are unable to care about the life of the mind and its cultivation. Richard Mitchell said something stupendously brilliant today about information and the inconsequentiality of information. The next time someone says to you, we don't need books anymore because computers and television do it best, the thing to do is not argue, it's simply to break their nose and walk away and never to speak to them again. That, that, that's, that's the way we do it in Pittsburgh. So these, together with useless and dangerous suppliers of school material, stupid and dishonest books, rivers of junk games, mechanical garbage, soda straws, cheap furniture, standardized tests which measure nothing at all that is real, these are vitally necessary to the American economy. We cannot afford school reform. That's not sarcasm, or it's sarcasm, but truth, too. Where would the useless personnel go? We're talking about millions and millions of people. <laughs> what would happen to, to the people who make the garbage pedal to schools? The people who transport the garbage, who store it, who distribute it, who advertise it, who debate about it in conferences? and ultimately carted away to the dump. We can't afford school reform if we pulled the plug on school expenditures that are unrelated to or even actively hostile to quite well understood ways to enhance children's mental development. A twofold disaster would occur in the American economy. First, in the short run, millions would be thrown out of work. And in the long run, tens of millions of well-educated, not well-schooled graduates would rip apart the great employment systems of 20th century life and once again build a world of independent lives. But not before a long period of chaos 
ran its course. There is no way to get from here to there without some terrible interlude. Benson, Vermont is not an accident. It's the successful realization of a philosophical vision of an orderly, predictable society layered intelligently like a good English episcopacy needs to be. We got Benson, Vermont because men and women with a collectivist social vision, not socialists like Karl Marx, but industrialists like Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, Vincent Astor, John D. Rockefeller, and Henry Ford, and the squadrons of socialist mandarins that their private foundations and their think tanks empowered, forced a command economy on all of us bit by bit, an economy unable to respond flexibly to real human needs, but instead one wedded to organizing human life into a universal system of control. Then the bloated monsters of big government, big business, and big institution, I don't see any difference between them, among them, which set astride the chest of society, became desperate to conceive places where excess human labor capacity could be stored till some way was figured out to get rid of it. And they came up with Benson, Vermont, pretty little Benson, Vermont, where the school devours the resources of the town to provide work through schooling. Schooling for what? Nobody could really tell you, so don't ask. Thank you. You didn't think I had that in me, did you, Pat? <laughs> uh, I'd be, you know, I've had such a, a strange odyssey over the last four years. By, by some accident when I was a school teacher, my 30-year teaching career was divided about 10, 10, and 10 uh, among very wealthy kids from very prosperous families for the first third, a very eclectic group of, of kids who were deemed to be emotionally disturbed, even though their parents weren't told that. But the, so the, they were the richest, the poorest, and all the levels in between mixed together. And in the final eight years I taught uh, on the lip of uh, Harlem, it, the, the next to worst class on the eighth grade, according to school records, where large numbers of the kids uh, did not have functioning families or even parents that had social worker attaches. Uh, and, and the same thing has happened in this speaking. I don't solicit any speaking engagements. When they stop coming, I won't be the unhappiest person. I've gained 101 pounds. How about that? Because people take me out and feed me. <laughs> Who can resist free drinks and stuff like that? Well, uh, but but I spoke at the farm commune in central Tennessee. Ed, Ed you were there, huh? Made trouble there, too. <laughs> uh, for lots and lots of homeschoolers everywhere, including the fundamentalist Christian homeschoolers, who I discovered in six... I was challenged by the guy who sent his four kids to Harvard as a homeschooler. He said, they'll lock you in a back room and convert you there. And there's nothing you like better when you come from Pittsburgh than be told someone's going to push you around. So, so I went down, I found lovely, gentle people who didn't conform in any way to the descriptions in the press or to the descriptions that, that intelligent friends of mine, uh, you know, my, my uh, superiors had, had issued to me. And so I thought, well, maybe it was just Atlanta, Georgia. And so I went down to, to Orlando, Florida, which has is, is got to be the ugliest place in, in the Western world. Uh, and yet the, the head of the fundamentalist Christian homeschooling group over breakfast said to me, you know, I don't know whether there's a God or not, he said, but I've lived as though there was one 
and I've lived as though there wasn't one. And I can tell you in my own life and with my own family, it's night and day. So I said, golly, I don't know an academic intellectual who, who would be so flexible about uh, his bread and butter. Uh, but so, so I've spoken for just about everybody. And uh, as long as I spoke for the John Birch Society, uh, for churches, for colleges that I despise, like the University of Chicago, which has probably done more damage in the 20th century than any other single institution, if it's not Columbia Teachers College, both institutions of which were founded and completely paid for by, by the Rockefeller fortune. Uh, so I've had a lot of experience. It doesn't mean I'm wise, but I have a lot of information. If you press the buttons, it'll come out. Does any Italian like to speak first, and then I'll take the rest of you? <laughs> okay. Oh, good. Because <laughs> I don't have an answer to that question. There's a Dorothy well, we Goodman in the back, who who is is a lovely lady. I have to. Be gentle, live, live down the reputation you gave me, John. But, no, I wanted to. You, you said at the beginning you didn't um, agree with Marshall about this whole question of vouchers. Yeah. And I wondered what what your thoughts are now about how we should proceed. As you know, I'm for vouchers, and I'm also for De Tocqueville and all those people throughout uh, American history and commentators thereon who have said. Uh, the federal system has great advantages, unlike England, France. We can do things locally, and if they work, fine, we can extend them. Uh, if, if they don't work, we can try something else. Roosevelt said that all the time. We must try things. So where do you think we go from here? I think that, that in an odd way, everyone who was at that voucher panel contributed something to my own understanding. I respected all those points of view, and I think they all participate in some truth, and all of them are wrong. Let me take the, the, the one that probably was, was, was closest to, 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 to my own intellectual thinking, which would be, Joe, uh, Joe, are you here somewhere? Yeah, you're over there. Joe's absolutely correct that you can design voucher systems that will resist government incursion. And Milton Friedman's been doing that out in California. He just can't get backing, uh, you know, for a major push that would have a chance to succeed. And John Walton, who had $25 million, wouldn't back Friedman's proposal. Nevertheless, the, the language of all law is so flexible that it depends on the attitude of the legislator and his police force. And I think we're at a juncture now in American history when a gauntlet has to be thrown down. I say you take the voucher money and you disregard the orders and instructions that come with it and you close the door to the inspection teams. Now, is that bravado? Tell me something. How do you think a loudmouth like John Gatto survived in an inner city Manhattan school for 30 years, overwhelmed? It was the socialist capital, not of New York State, of the United States, the Upper West Side of Manhattan. So I was persona non grata from the get go. It is an Alice in Wonderland house of cards. The strongest power that the school institution has is your fear. That's, that's where it largely, it's true that they can select one person and by a gargantuan effort and six months spying and a huge outlay of money, they can crush that person's life. It is true. I'll tell you what's not true. They can't do that to eight people. They don't have the resources. Marshall and I stood in a room at the University in Sacramento, the Northern California Homeschooling Convention, and we had talked informally about this. And the head attorney 
for the state of California's education department, who was becoming increasingly frustrated. He was there, in a sense, to put the fear of God into 1,500 parents on the floor of the gymnasium. And he said, when there were just a few of you, we could allow you to get away with this. He said, but look at you, it's a horrible embarrassment. Something will have to be done. Now, the parents all burst into laughter. <laughs> but I knew that if it had come that close to the surface, that some of the discussions in the state ed department were how to make moves, how to target uh, people to destroy so that the press would multiply this absolutely fictitious uh, uh, idea that they can destroy many of you. You can destroy all of yourselves, but the government cannot do that. Now, some of you will realize that I'm really misquoting Hegel, because what happens with that kind of oppression, for God's sake, what does the Soviet collapse in 70 years tell you? except that no amount of state repression, if, it's, if it deviates from the traditions of the people significantly, can pos no amount of surveillance turning families against each other, eliminating 20 or 30 million people, 10 years before the Soviet Union collapsed. I, wanted, I, I belong to a, a political party in, in New York State that doesn't exist in any other state called the Conservative Party. And I only do it because they have a room at the Plaza Hotel where they give free drinks. And, and once a month, they got some fancy speaker that I would not be qualified as a junior high school teacher to listen to. And about 10 years ago, the guest was the American ambassador to the Vatican, Frank Shakespeare. I'll bet there are people in this room who know Frank Shakespeare. And what Shakespeare said in his elegant, oratund tones he gave us, a, he read us a lecture about why there is an ambassador to the Vatican. It absolutely stunned me. He said it's the finest intelligence gathering organization on planet Earth, and the records go back many, many centuries. Abraham Lincoln figured out, he was the guy who uh, installed, uh, at great cost to himself politically, uh, uh, a Vatican uh, ambassador because what he wanted to do was make deals with the Vatican and get intelligence. So 10 years ago, Shakespeare said, the Soviet Union is coming apart. He said, the parish priests report the confessions to the bishops, the bishops, the archbishops, the archbishops, the cardinals, they funnel it into the computer banks that are six levels under the Vatican and they've, they've come up with a target date. It's coming apart. They're gonna catch the souls and good for them. I'm a Roman Catholic, I hope they do. I, I, but that's another uh, lecture. <laughs> anyway, I don't know where I was going with that. Was that a, quite a question? <laughs> yeah. Dorothy, yes. Uh, he, you've actually just made very eloquently the comments I'd want to make in criticism of something you said. Sure. And that is you indicated that we're a command economy. We're not a mixed economy, we're a command economy. And it seems to me what you just said is that we're not a command economy. You know, the bureaucrats don't run the economy, people run the economy. Right now, my guess is every one of us is in violation of at least 25 federal statutes. Some of us, maybe more. Uh, but I they, stand corrected. It, you know, I'm really quite in sympathy with what this, you're This saying. is a very vibrant economy. We've got too much control, but it's not the bureaucrats that run this economy, and their control is weakening. That's why they're getting so exercised. Technology, I think, is going to put the bureaucrats not completely out of business, but it's going to even, it's going to weaken them. I think it's just the opposite of Big Brother and George Orwell. I think technology is going to let us all co cooperate, communicate with each other, and totally ignore, if not totally ignore, largely ignore all these bureaucratic mandates that we'll just laugh at like your group laughed at that fellow in California. Okay. Uh, Steve Donsbach, Fort Wayne. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you talked about uh, working with those uh, eighth grade kid the, the bottom next to the bottom group and about the murderously hard work that you uh, 
uh, were able to get the, ha had them do. Uh, I'm just curious, what was that uh, murderously hard work that these supposedly uh, incompetent kids uh, were in fact able to do? Well, uh, in nine days, I'm going to give a six-hour workshop in Vancouver and Victoria. I'm not trying to duck your question. I'll give you a few, a few examples. Uh, Nine of my kids for a year and a half virtually ran the homeless shelter on 114th Street and Broadway in the basement of the Presbyterian Church. They showed up at 6 o'clock in the morning. They were not kids with soft hearts. They're not kids with any tradition of doing this at all. They were kids that thought they were good uh, deal makers and they negotiated with me. I said, I need people to go in and worked like absolute animals from six and they had to prepare five course meals for 275 give or take 10 men women and children who, who came in off the street and the church in it really in its infinite wisdom decided that rather than slopping these people like hogs they were going to serve them on tables with tablecloths courses and they, you know and the uh, but first the food had all to be chopped and mixed and sometimes it had to be begged first and then chopped and mixed Then it had to be cooked then it had to be apportioned then the tables had to be set then they had to sh shift into their waiter uh, persona and see, you know, what, what, Something comes from the left and something from the right. I've never figured that out <laughs> There but but the kids did uh, And they had to time this then they had to clean clean the thing up. That's murderously hard work uh, what they traded that for was some escape from their documentary record. What I'm going to say now, undoubtedly, well, there's got to be one spy in the room. I mean, sooner or later, I'll end up before some committee testifying to this. But uh, I would destroy the adverse material in their school records, and they would do that. What they didn't know is I always went through in the first of the year and took out all the adverse material and destroyed it. And, uh, so did I fool them. So, <laughs> uh, let me give you a few other, a few other uh, examples. Uh, what we did every year, and I never booked classes, so we means... Uh, whoever fit this exercise. Uh, th this went back 20 years, so each year we updated this. I did an inventory of all the businesses that existed on the west side of Manhattan between Central Park and Riverside Drive from 122nd Street down to 59th Street, and they were divided according to the type. The purpose of that was to figure out which of those businesses could be wheedled or cajoled out of part-time work, summer work, uh, and, th and then we would send teams out, usually girls for this, to figure out where the soft spots in those businesses were when the best times to approach the people who might have work to hand out uh, would be available and where it wouldn't be too busy to do that. That's very hard work, especially if you're a 13-year-old kid. and and. and I'm going to say especially on the west side of Manhattan if you're a 13-year-old black kid because 13-year-old black kids out of school during the school day are considered to already have committed many crimes. So what these kids had to learn how to do was how to move swiftly and efficiently and either not look like a 13-year-old kid, which most of them succeeded in doing. I mean, it's a simple matter of replacing a notebook with a clipboard and never smiling. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of tricks. We did the same inventory with Columbia University, which is an immense, one of these mega system universities with NYU. And, and out of both of those excursions, we developed so many hundreds of possible bases for kids. I mean, hundreds of, that there was an embarrassment of riches, how to supply all the various divisions of the university and individual professors and graduate students who wanted students as please as stop -a. Okay. <laughs> and thank you very much for finishing on time as well. Da -da 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 -da.